Welcome to South Asheboro Church of God. So glad you decided to be a part of this uh, midweek service. Just let go and let God have his way here tonight. Amen. Pray. As we pray, let's uh, continue to pray uh, for our nation. Our nation needs God in it. Uh, pray for Rayford and Alicia Simpson. Uh, Rayford Simpson, uh, that's Alicia Simpson, one of Sharon's been given a request in because she's taking radiation. Her, the day Sharon, Sister Sharon got a call to go over because Rayford was over at the doctor's office and wanted somebody to take him to the hospital. She went over to get him and couldn't get him. He couldn't get in the car, and he was in the parking lot, and they ended up having to get the ambulance, and he's got fluid around his heart. So remember that family. She's taking radiation, and so she's – and she don't have – she can't drive. And so after church, we're going to go get her and take her home. So just pray that, you know, God will work out in that situation. Yes. Uh, pray for our revival. This uh, starts on Sunday with – uh, Brother Bowen, you know, that's revival services. You know, we're already in revival. Right. Pray for Liam. Uh, it's uh, Sister Tracy's grandson. I uh, said they had to take him to the doctor today. Uh, continue praying for Megan, my sister-in-law's uh, granddaughter. Uh, they did take her out of ICU, but uh, she's still in, in bad shape. Uh, mainly pray for her soul. Uh, pray for Sister Angela and her family. Uh, pray for Brother and Sister Bow. Uh Continue praying for Lily and Sister Gary and Sister. Has anybody else got a prayer request? Yes. Okay, if we will stand and go to the Lord in prayer.
Ti mums, ti mums bija nūja. Anybody else need prayer? We'll pray for you tonight. I need to pray for my mother, too. She's not feeling well. She got ready for church and said she just didn't feel good. We need to pray for her as well. We can go home now and say we've already been in church. Praise God. Good to have uh, Brother Scott and Sister Ashley back with us. I know God kept them safe in their travel. And good to have them home. Praise God. I want to speak on a moment. Let's revive us again. In Psalms 85 and 6, the psalmist David said to the Lord, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? You know, if there's ever been a need for a revival, it's in the day that we're in. We need revival. All the churches... They need to humble themselves, pray, ask God to forgive them for complacency, and get back to preaching God's word, living by the word of God, and we can see revival in this nation. But he said, if you will, he said, if my people who are called by my name, that's Christians, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. And you'll be just conditional, if my people. Praise God. Let's continue to worship as we get to us.
uh, Sister Amy, come and lead us in the congregational. Heavens Jubilee. I'm thankful to be in his house tonight, aren't you? He's worthy of all our praise. Let's sing unto him. Some glad morning we shall see. get to heaven oh what singing oh what shouting but let's do a little bit of it while we're here on our way to heaven praise God hallelujah let's continue to worship and giving and get our ushers come to receive the evening offering tithes and offering praise God hallelujah brother Albright would you pray over this time of worship
especially bless you for your giving tonight. Amen. This time I'll have Brother Baker coming in ministering song. Amen. Today that would be. This old world is in bad shape right now, but one day it'll all be over. There's coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye, all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, a glorious day, or that will be. What a day that will be When my Jesus I shall see And I look upon his face The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promise what a day, glorious day, oh, that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. Forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day, or oh, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, oh, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, a oh, glorious day, or oh, that will be. Just think about it when Jesus, we see Jesus face to face. You know, we talk to him, we pray to him. But one of these days we're going to see him face to face. The one who saved us. We brought us up out of that miry clay and horrible pit. This time I'm going to turn the service to our pastor, Brother Sheldon. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise tonight. John. John was in the spirit of the Lord's day. He was caught up into that third heaven there in the throne room of God. 
And he saw the majesty and the glory and the beauty of that place. Oh, God. And he said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. We can, we can sing about heaven that day, what it's going to be like. We can preach about it and teach about it the best of our ability. But nothing will ever uh, be able in this life to convey to us what heaven's really like. But we're going to go there by the grace of God. And with the help of God, we're going to make it there. Can you say amen? amen. Children's Church, y'all can go on back. I appreciate what I feel and sense here tonight. The, the anointing, the spirit of God that's in our midst. I'm glad that we don't have to go check at the door and make sure Jesus is not outside knocking, trying to get in. I'm glad he's in here. Can you say amen? I saw something this week that was one of the most ridiculous things I think I've ever seen in my life. I saw a, uh, a, a man who was the CEO of a company, and I don't, it was coming out of a restaurant, going into a restaurant, one or the other, and there were two, two boys, looked like prom dates. Uh, one of the boys had a tuxedo on, and the other boy was wearing a red prom dress. A red prom dress. And that CEO of that whatever company it was he worked for, he made the comment that that looks ridiculous. Well, he just said what a lot of people were thinking. And I saw it, and it did look ridiculous. The boy had on a red, off the shoulder, long flowing prom dress like a woman. And I thought, dear God, how much farther can this nation go from the word of God? Once that thing begins, there is no limitations now. Anything and everything is accepted. And that, <clears throat> that man, they call it the woke movement now. And, uh, you know, they went on social media and they tried to ruin him and they did. He ended up losing his job as the CEO of that company. Uh, the company stood behind him for a little bit, but then those people in Hollywood, that Hollywood crowd, they got in behind these two boys and, uh, you know, shamed that CEO, started targeting some of the businesses they did business with, and some of those businesses said, we can't do business with you because of him. And so ultimately they fired that man, that CEO. And I thought, dear God, if that man's willing to stand up and say something about it, what is the church doing today? Why do we sit silent behind the walls, inside the four walls, and but yet go out in that world and we just refuse to, you know, we just kind of look the other way? The church ought to stand up and stand on the word of God and say, we're not going to accept this. You pass whatever law you want to pass, we're not going to accept it because God will never accept that kind of lifestyle, that kind of sin. Can you say amen? amen. Well, I'm not preaching that, but I am close. Amen. First Peter chapter 1 tonight. Glad to be in the house of God. Um, my doctors have told me I'm going to have to slow down a little bit. And so thank God for doctors sometimes. So if, if, if I slow down a little bit, that means you'll have to pick up a little bit. So if you'll help me a little more, that'll help me. Is that right? And if you don't help me, then I'll have to be a little more forceful. And my doctors have told me don't do that. Amen? So help take care of me. By helping me tonight preach a little while, <laughs> amen. We're glad you're here. Glad Scott Nash is back and Lilypad. That's my nickname for her, Lilypad. I love that. I don't know if they like it, but I don't care. I like it. And I'm going to call her that. And uh, we're glad they're back. I missed them this weekend. I hadn't, that's why I went back and hugged them. I hadn't seen them since they got back in town. But glad they're back with us tonight. First Peter chapter 1, begin reading in verse 13. Bible says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves, not conforming yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, he said, So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, all manner of your conduct. He said to be holy in that. He said not fashioning yourself 
or not conforming yourself uh, according to the former lust in your ignorance. He said, as obedient children, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, all manner of conduct, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. I wish every pew was filled up here tonight. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. God's not going to call us to do something that's not possible. So holiness is attainable in this life. You can live a holy life. If it wasn't possible, then God would have never told us to be holy if there was no possibility of that here on this earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the joy of being in your house again tonight. Father, I thank you for the spirit of God that we've already felt, the touch of heaven. God, I thank you for those, <clears throat> Sister Shelton and Sister Sharon, that were touched in the altars here already, God, in the opening prayer. Thank you for the singing tonight that has richly blessed our hearts. I thank you, Lord, now as we've come to the word of God for the next little while. Help this preacher, Lord. I need your touch, as always. I, I need your help, God. I've never tried it without you. I can't do it without you. I confess that here tonight. Lord, I, I pray you'll touch me spiritually, touch me physically, and you'll help us now, God. I pray that this message will touch hearts in this congregation, that you'll touch those watching online tonight. We pray there'll be a drawing to an altar here this evening. God, you'll work on every one of us. I'm glad you're still working on us, God, conforming us to the image of your Son. And I pray that our lives will be pleasing to you, God, and we will live as obedient children of the Most High God. And everything that's done, we'll praise you and love you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Give God a hand of praise tonight. Praise the Lord. I want to preach to you for a little while on this thought, simply God's requirement of holiness. God's requirement of holiness. Among theologians today, and even among the church, there is much debate going on even right now. There is controversy when it comes to the subject of holiness. I want to say this flat-footed right here this evening, that there is no question and there can be no question that holiness is God's standard of living and holiness is God's requirement for His children. Holy living is a life lived by Christians in the conformity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I would say this to you tonight, your salvation experience uh, uh, since you've been born again is not conforming you into the image of Jesus Christ, then I would question your salvation experience. When we are born again, according to the Word of God, the moment we are saved, I'm telling you there's a change that takes place in us. We have a new nature inside of us. The old is to be put off, but that old worldly way, that old worldly lifestyle is to be put off by and we are to put on the new, we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Holiness is a life of surrender. Holiness is a life of sacrifice. Holiness is a life of self-denial. It is a life of separation, uh, and it is found in Christ and being conformed to Jesus himself. Simply put, my friend, holiness... Uh, and holy living is being Christ-like. This is the standard that God requires. Anything beneath His standard is of the world, and it is worldly in the sight of God. We know that Jesus Christ, that lovely Son of God, is the embodiment of holiness. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto, made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. According to the word of God, uh, holiness is a reflection of Christ in our lives. 
Holiness is a reproduction uh, of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, uh, in our lives that deals with our attitudes, uh, that deals with our actions, uh, that deals with our appetites, and deals with our appearance. Uh, I'm telling you, if you've been born again, uh, if you're a child of God, uh, we're going to reflect Jesus inwardly, uh, and we're going to reflect Him outwardly. Uh, if you have holiness in your heart, if your heart is holy before God, and that's where it has to begin, it has to begin in that heart. If that heart is holy under the Lord, I'm telling you, friend, it is a natural thing that happens. Your body and your spirit is going to be holy unto God Almighty. Man is a tripart being made up of body, soul, and spirit. I'm telling you, if that heart is holy, that inward man's holy, uh, that outward man's going to follow suit, uh, and that body will be holy under God. Can you say amen? This is what made that early church so effective. I love to read about that early church. I'm going to say something a little bit ugly, and I'm going to move right on. I, I don't really care about reading about a lot of our churches today around the world. Don't get excited about reading about a lot of them, but I do get excited uh, when I get in that book of Acts and begin to read about that early church uh, and what God did through them. That early church was effective. They didn't have to have gimmicks. Oh, great God, help me here. Uh, they didn't have to have the gimmicks. Uh, they didn't have to have self-help programs. Uh, they didn't have to have programs of any kind. Uh, they simply were holy people uh, that were on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and everywhere that they went, uh, you could see Jesus in their lives. I'm telling you, they were holy uh, because they were conformed to the Son of God. I know what happened on the day of Pentecost. I realized that was the birth of that early church. I realized the tongues, uh, you know, they spoke with other tongues that the Spirit gave the utterance. Uh, but there's more to this baptism than just speaking in tongues. I'm telling you, there's a holy life that follows that. Can you say amen? They were not just a Pentecostal church. Uh, that early church was a holiness church. I'm telling you tonight, my friend, Jesus is not coming for a Baptist bride. Jesus is not coming for a Methodist bride. Jesus is not coming for a Church of God bride. Jesus is not coming for an independent bride. Jesus is coming for a holy bride, a holy church. He's coming for a holy people. Can you say amen? The members of that early church, they were a holy people. And this is how that they could say in Acts 4 and 13 uh, that they took knowledge of them, speaking of that church, uh, that they had been with Jesus. And the Bible said they were called Christians first uh, at Antioch. That name Christian today, uh, it, it has many different meanings, and it's come to mean uh, uh, anyone who adheres to the faith, uh, whether by tradition uh, or by experience. I believe you'll agree with me tonight uh, that most anything and most everything today uh, calls itself a Christian. It's popular to call yourself a Christian today. It's popular to say, oh, I, I go to such and such a church uh, in this hour. I, I know there's a lot of wickedness in this world, uh, but there's a movement today, especially among young people, uh, just to say, I'm a Christian. I, I go to this church. I go to that mega church. I, you know, we have all these things. Uh, today, most anything and everything calls itself a Christian, uh, but the question has to be raised, uh, how much of Christ uh, do we really see in this church age? How much do we see when we say, uh, you know, that calls itself a church there? Uh, how much of Jesus Christ, uh, how much of his holiness uh, do we really see in this church generation today? I'm telling you, this is a Christless church age for the most part. There's plenty of churches. There's churches popping up here and there. There's a church nearly on every street corner, uh, amen, but most of what we see today that calls itself the church, uh, it is whirling. 
I'm telling you, Christ is not part of worldliness. He's not seen in worldliness. His church is a holy church. And if I'm going to be part of it, then I've got to be holy as he is holy. Can somebody give him a hand of praise tonight? Hallelujah to God. In that early church, they were first called Christians uh, because they were completely devoted to following Jesus Christ. Uh, and when people saw them, uh, whether it was in the marketplace, uh, whether it was in the temple, uh, wherever it may have been, when they saw those people, uh, they saw a reflection of the Son of God. They recognized Christ in their lives. These men and women were holy people uh, because the holiness of Jesus Christ uh, was being lived out in their lives. It was His holiness. Uh, it was a reflection of His purity uh, that shone through them uh, and caused sinners and caused wicked people uh, to stand up and recognize uh, and take knowledge uh, that there's something different about those people right there. They recognized Jesus in them. I'm telling you, friend, they did not associate them with the worldliness of that age. They associated them with the holiness of Jesus Christ. They identified with him. Everywhere they went, they identified with the Son of a living God. I'm telling you, in this church age, I agree with Brother Charlie. We need to fall on our knees. We need to repent of our sin against God. And we need to identify again, not with this worldly age, but we need to identify with the Son of a living God. We need to identify with the holiness found in Jesus. Jesus Christ. This is how we're to live. When people see us, they ought to see Him. When they see us, we ought to be identified with His holiness. The Bible said in 1 John 2 and 6, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. 1 John 3 and 3 says, Every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he, speaking of Christ, is pure. 1 John 4 and 17 says, Because as he is, so are we in this world. God is saying here in the Word of God that we are to be Christ-like in thought. We are to be Christ-like in word. We are to be Christ-like indeed. We are to be Christ-like in our actions. And when we are like Christ in our thought, in our word, in our deed, in our actions, it will affect everything about our life. Everything inwardly, everything outwardly will begin to match up with His Word and the holiness of His Word. And when that happens, I'm telling you, somebody's going to stand up in that world. Your lost family members are going to stand up up, uh, and they're going to take knowledge uh, that we have been with Jesus, uh, that now we identify with him. Can you say amen? This holy God wants his people to be a holy people. Matter of fact, I'll go a step further and say not only does he want that, he commands that. He requires that if we're going to be his. Three times in the book of Deuteronomy. God says, Thou art an holy people under the Lord thy God. At least four times in the book of, Levit of Leviticus, God declares, Be ye holy, for I am holy. When Israel there sang the song of Moses, after they crossed over that Red Sea, a portion of that song declares the holiness of God. Exodus 15 and 11 said, As they sang, Who is like unto thee, O Lord? among the gods who is like thee glorious in holiness fearful in praises doing wonders then God said in Leviticus 4 and 11 and 44 for I am the Lord your God ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves and ye shall be holy for I am holy now somebody said well brother Shelton 
I don't believe that we can attain holy living in this life. I believe that's what happens after you die, after you go to heaven. And, but the Bible shows us that this is possible to live holy here in this life uh, because we have been partakers of the holiness uh, of God. In other words, we are able to live holy. Uh, we're able to live sanctified. Uh, we're able to live separated from the wickedness and the sin of this world uh, because the God that we serve, uh, the God that lives in us, uh, whose temple we are, uh, he is holy. Can you say amen? Ephesians 1 and 4 says, According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, I know when you start talking about holiness today, uh, some people get uneasy. Some people draw up tight. Some people cut their eyes and look at you funny. When you start dealing with holiness, uh, some people resent holiness uh, because it simply condemns them uh, in their own sins. I've had people say to me, uh, you know, this way is just too straight that you're preaching. This way is just too narrow that you're preaching. Uh, my response has always been the same and will always be the same. Uh, I didn't write the book. Uh, it's not my word. Uh, this is what God says. Uh, Jesus said that broad is the road uh, that leads to destruction. Uh, and many there be that go in there at. Uh, but straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. Uh, if you think it's too straight. Uh, if you think it's too narrow. Uh, don't you get mad with me. You need to take it up with God. It's not my word. It is his word. And the way that leads to heaven, it is a straight gate. It is a narrow road. And it is a high way of holiness if you're going to go there. Somebody raise your hands and give him praise tonight. Hallelujah. How am I doing, Sister Shelton? Others have said, they live this way simply by rules of do's and don'ts, just rules to them, not really in their heart. Had a man say some time ago, didn't say it to me, wish he would have. I just told a man one day, I said, I just ain't afraid of nobody. I don't mean that, you know, boastful. I, I just don't have a fear of people. I, you know, God removes that fear in us. God, we've not given that a spirit of fear, but of love and of power, and he gives us a sound mind. Thank God. I need that, don't you, Sister Audrey? You need a sound mind. Had a man said, went come heard me preach at a revival, and uh, after the service was over, he was nice to me, friendly to me. Matter of fact, he came back another time, heard me preach as a pastor, and, and it got back to me. Word got back to me. He told another fellow minister, uh, he said, I, I love Brother Shelton. I Enjoyed his preaching, really liked that. Uh, but I could never have him come preach at my church. Uh, I could never fellowship with him in his church. Uh, you want to know why? Because I have a mustache. That's what I did, just what you're doing right now. Because he wears a mustache, uh, I can't fellowship with him. We don't believe in having a mustache. But I didn't have one at the time. I, I shaved it off, but I'm growing it back now just for him. Hey, Amen. Rules, list of do's and don't. Hey Amen. That's not in God's word. There's no word in that Bible that's wrong for a man to have a mustache. I, I don't believe a woman should have one, but there's no sin in that. It, it becomes just, a, just a, a list of do's and don'ts and without any holiness in the heart or hunger for what God's word says. Some have just made holiness a, a list of rules of what you can do and what you can't do. I'm telling you, friend, real holy living is in the heart of that person when they have the very nature of God uh, living inside of them. Uh, it's no longer a list of do's and don'ts. Uh, it is living as children of obedience uh, unto God out of love. Uh, I live like I do, uh, not to be saved, uh, but because I am saved, uh, I live like I do uh, because I love God. Uh, I love His holiness uh, and I want to live holy all the days of my life. Holiness is the very nature of God. And if we are his children, when we're born again, we become partakers of that divine nature. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 4 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things 
that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. When the Lord come in our heart, when we got born again, now we have that new nature. And I'm telling you, that new nature is going to crave and desire heavenly things and holy things. Now we're going to live to please the Lord. Before we got saved, we lived to please self. We lived to satisfy the old man. But when Jesus comes in, thank God he dethrones that old man. I said he dethrones thrones the old man uh, and he takes the throne of our heart uh, and now we're a partaker of the holiness of God Almighty uh, and now my friend there's a change uh, in our actions, our appetites, our attitudes, uh, there's a change in our appearance. Uh, we are holy under God because the God that lives in us uh, through his spirit, uh, he is a holy God. Christ now lives within us. And his life is in us, which is holy, and now it's lived out through us. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Galatians 2 and 20. When he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But it's Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I know, we, well, listen, I, I told Sister Shelton, I told somebody today, I, I said, I believe it was you, I said, you know, we've, we've watched people down through the years and we've helped people in church and trying to get them in there and trying to, you know, they get in, they get out, they get in, they get out. I, I said, the truth be told, uh, they probably never got in to begin with. Uh, we've been trying to get tares to live right, but a tear is not going to live right. Uh, I said, a tear is not going to live right. A sinner uh, is not going to live righteous. Uh, but when a person's really born again, uh, you're going to see a change. Uh, somebody said, uh, we don't see that change in people today uh, like we saw years ago. Uh, you want to know why? Uh, because I believe we're making a lot of people calling them Christians uh, that's never really been born again, uh, never really had that divine nature, a partaker of that. Uh, because if you get born again, uh, there's going to be a dramatic change in your life. Uh, when Jesus comes in, uh, your whole world is going to change. Uh, and holiness uh, will be your desire. Can you shout amen? When Jesus comes in, I'm telling you, it will produce holy living within us. Holiness deals with the sin question in a man's life. Back years ago when people got saved, immediately they begin to realize this is not pleasing to God. I'm going to lay it down. God is not pleased with this. I'm going to lay it down. Today people say they got saved and they're trying to hold on to anything and everything that they can. They don't want to lay anything down for God. I'm telling you, holiness in that heart uh, will cause you to love holiness, uh, to love what God loves, and to hate what God hates. Holiness deals with the sin question in the men's lives. And if Christians are going to go to heaven, uh, then we have to stop straining at practical holiness. I said we have to stop straining. We have to stop gagging at it. Holiness is not an experience that happens at death. But scriptures teach us uh, that we can live sanctified, uh, that we can live holy. Uh, and this is what the Lord requires uh, of those who call themselves Christians. Uh, holy living is a practice of our daily lives. I believe in salvation. And I also believe in that second definite work of grace, sanctification. I believe what our declaration of faith says that we believe in sanctification subsequent to the new birth. That means to follow after or after that. I believe that when a person's born again, their position changes. They're no longer a sinner. They're no longer in darkness. They're in light. They're a child of God. 
But that second work of grace, sanctification, I, I believe it's instantaneous. I believe it follows after salvation. I don't believe anybody can really get born again. I, and then sanctification, that practice of holy living is not going to follow after that. If you really get born again, I, your position in Christ changes. I, I'm telling you the way you practice living I, is going to be sanctified. I, it's going to be to please the Lord of glory. I believe it follows after. I believe it's instantaneous, but I believe it's also progressive. In other words, he's still working on me. He sanctified me, but he's still sanctified me. He's working on me every day, trying to conform me into the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul sets forth this sanctification and holiness of living. In Romans 12 and 1, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies uh, as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He did not say to present your body as a living sacrifice unto the pastor, unto a preacher, unto mom and daddy. He didn't say even that local church. But he said we are to present ourselves acceptable in the sight of God. I'm telling you, I've been preaching long enough to know that there's a lot of things going on in the churches today that they might be acceptable to men. They might be acceptable in some churches. I'm telling you, things that are not acceptable to God, uh, things that are not pleasing to God, uh, things that are contrary to the Word of God. Listen, men will accept things that are contrary to God's Word. They do it all the time. Churches will accept things that are contrary to God's Word. They do it all the time. This world is certainly going to accept anything that's contrary to the Word of God. I'm telling you what the Bible said. If it is not holy, if it is not pure in the sight of God, then God will not accept it. Listen to me, friend. You can have the applaud of the world. You can have the applaud of the church. But if it's not holy, you'll never get the applaud from heaven. I'd rather have the approval of God and to have the approval of me and the world over. Can you say amen tonight? What I'm telling you in the word of God is still either holiness or it is hell. I said it's holiness or it's hell. That is what the Bible says. It is God's standard for his people. It is God's requirement. I've said it before. If you're going to be a Baptist, I know some Baptist folks that are Christian people. I believe they'll go to heaven. I believe they'll love God. I believe they'll live right. Matter of fact, I know some Baptist people that live a whole lot better than some Church of God people. Don't shout me down here tonight. I'm telling you, there's some Baptist people that live good Christian lives. If you're going to be Baptist, you better be a holy Baptist. I know some Methodist people that are Christian people. I believe they'll live right and love God. I believe they'll go when the trumpet sounds. If they die, they'll go to heaven. If you're going to be Methodist, you better be a holiness Methodist person. If you're going to be independent, you better be a holiness independent person. If you're going to be church of God, you better be a holiness church of God person because the Bible said that without holiness, no man's going to see the Lord. If you're going to go to heaven, if I'm going to go there when I die, if I'm going to go in that rapture, I better identify with Jesus Christ. I said I better be conforming to the image of the Son of God. It is holiness. That makes that distinguishing mark between the saints of God and the sinner, those of the world. The standards of this world are completely opposed to the standard of God's holiness. How am I doing pretty good? I told her to tug my coat if I got too rowdy. You cannot, you cannot support homosexuality and call yourself a wholeness person. You cannot support two men walking into a restaurant, one dressed in a tuxedo and another man wearing a prom dress like a woman, uh, and support that and call yourself a wholeness person. You cannot support lesbianism uh, and call yourself a wholeness person. You, you cannot support transgender uh, and call yourself a wholeness person. 
You cannot support abortion, uh, that which God hates and detests, the murder uh, of innocent children, uh, and call yourself a holiness person. Uh, I'm telling you, a holiness person uh, is going to hate everything that God hates uh, and going to love everything uh, that God loves. The cry today uh, ought to be, Lord, forgive us uh, for our ungodliness. Uh, forgive us for our unholiness. Uh, hey, forgive us uh, and make us holy again. Uh, conform us uh, into what Jesus Christ is. Can you say, man? He shines and praise him tonight. Cannot support wickedness and worldliness. You call yourself a holy person. Psalms 97 and 10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Psalms 119 and 128 said, Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Real holiness in the heart of a man is going to cause that man to hate what God hates. That is, seeing in every form and fashion and love what God loves. Sinners are trying their best to conform to the image of this world. You see the things that people do to their bodies, how they mark their bodies and tattoo their bodies and pierce their bodies and mutilate their bodies and all the things they do, you know, sexually to try to, you know, conform to the image of this world and to the society of today. But I'm telling you, that truly born-again child of God, they're going to be the exact opposite of that. That holy man or woman is striving daily to be conformed not to Hollywood but to holy living to Jesus Christ. Now, listen to me, friend. When I go out in that world, I want people to see Jesus in me in the way that I act, the way that I talk, the things I do, the places I go, the way I dress. I want them to see Christ in me. I want to identify with the Son of a living God. See, man, we must let never Allow the standards of this world to shape our opinions, our ideals, or our decisions. Somebody said, well, the church up the road is doing it. Who cares? I don't care if the church up the road does it, the church down the road, and the church over in the holler, and the church over on the mountaintop. If it's contrary to God's word, we cannot afford to let that shape us, to shape our opinions, what we believe and how we live. You and I need to get in the book, find out what God says about it, and then match our lives up with it. He'll give us the grace. He'll give us the power to live a holy life. Somebody said, well, you know, they're doing this and that. Well, let them do this and that. I want somebody to know I'm a child of God. I'm a holy vessel. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. And a holy God's living on the inside of me. The world should never dictate how we dress. I refuse to let Hollywood tell me how to dress. I believe I'm going to let God's Word teach me about that. I said, I refuse to let Hollywood teach me about what's appropriate dress and how it's all right to dress because Hollywood ain't going to mention modesty to you. I said, Hollywood ain't going to tell you to cover anything up. Hollywood's going to tell you to take it off and show it. Is that right? But God's Word teaches us modesty and how we're to dress as men and women and children of the Most High God. Somebody told me before, and I got so tired of hearing that mess. God don't care about the outside, don't care how you dress, don't care what you do with that. Uh, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard in my life. That would be like taking this tabernacle right here, taking this church, and on the front of it, taking all the crosses down, 
taking all the signs down, uh, taking the steeple off of it, uh, and put signs up and says cigarettes for sale here, uh, girly show inside, uh, you know, all of those things. Uh, but then when you come inside here, you realize, oh, this is a church. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, people recognize this is a church when they run by. Uh, they recognize this is a temple of God, uh, not by what's on the inside, but what they see first uh, on the outside. Uh, they, they know when they run by, they identify this uh, by what they see, the steeple, the cross, the sign, uh, the building, uh, that that is a church. Uh, amen. It's a church on the inside, uh, and it ought to reflect that on the outside. Uh, I said it ought to reflect that on the outside of the child of God. Man can't see in your heart, but they can sure see what's on the outside. We can't afford to let this world dictate how we dress. One woman said, told her pastor, her new pastor, oh, God, help me not to be ugly here. Told her new pastor, you tell your wife that it's okay for her to wear pants. She wore dresses. Tell your wife it's okay to wear pants. And if anybody in this church has a problem about it, tell them to come and see me. I would have said to that pastor's wife, you want to know about that, you better go see what God says about it. I said, you better see what his word says about that. The Bible is clear. I, you know, I, I thought about this this afternoon, Brother Scott. We get nervous when we see a man wearing a dress. Everybody, most everybody does. I do. If I see a man out in high heels, uh, got his leg shade, wearing a dress, uh, I get nervous. I'm not going to invite him to sit in the car with me and ride around with me. Is that right? I don't know why to the opposite of that. When we see a man dressed like a woman, uh, it makes us uncomfortable. Uh, it makes us nervous. Uh, but when we see women wearing men's clothes, uh, we don't think anything about it. Am I preaching all right? Pull my coat down if you need to. I think I'm just going to plow on out here. The Bible said uh, in Deuteronomy 22 and 5, that a man is not to wear that which pertaineth unto a woman, uh, and a woman is not to wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Somebody said, oh, Brother Shelton, hold on, I got you there. That's the Old Testament. I'm telling you, friend, that is part of the moral law of God. It was his moral law in the beginning. It is his moral law today. God said that is his moral law to keep that man from wearing a prom dress. Come on and say amen. To keep that man from looking like a woman and to keep that woman from blurring the lines and looking like a man. Uh, that is still the moral law of God uh, even right now in 2021. Did you realize, did you realize that God likened a man wearing woman's clothes and a woman wearing man's clothes to the sin of homosexuality? Can you prove that? Yes, I can. Thank you for asking. He said that a man shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a woman, and a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, and they that do that, it is an abomination in the eyes of God. Then he went on to say that if a man lie with a man as a woman, homosexuality, it is an abomination in the sight of God. That's how much God detests that sin. That's how much God detests uh, the blurring of the sexes and the blurring of the lines. Uh, even McDonald's has got more sense uh, than a lot of our churches anymore. Uh, you go into McDonald's, uh, go to that bathroom, uh, look on the door. Uh, you don't see two stick figures. Uh, you don't see two women in dresses, one on both sides. Uh, you won't know which way to go. Uh, the man has a pants on, the woman has a dress on, uh, and that's how you know which bathroom to go into. Uh, sometimes even McDonald's uh, has more sense, uh, spiritual sense, uh, than we do in the church of a living God today. We don't get nervous anymore. We don't get uncomfortable. When we see a woman wearing a, a, a man's clothes, we just become desensitized to it. But God likened it to abomination. God said he detests that because it leads to this. It leads to where we are right now. It leads to transgender. It leads to homosexuality. It leads to perversion. 
men doing things that's not natural for a man to do. It is not natural for a man to burn in his heart uh, and to lust after another man. God did not put that nature in a man or a woman to lust after another woman. He said it is an abomination. We can never allow this world to dictate how we dress, how we act, what our appetites are, what our desires are, what our attitudes are. Amen. This world's a relentless foe to the high life of Christianity and the high life of holiness. And any compromise with this world will distract your attention from the Holy One of God. Holiness is still a separated life from this evil life and this wicked uh, and this sin cursed world you listen to me uh, I do not want to identify as a woman uh, I don't want to identify as a transgender uh, I don't want to identify as a pervert uh, I don't want to identify uh, as a rock and roll star uh, I don't want to identify uh, as anything to do with this world uh, I want to identify as a holy vessel uh, full of the power and the spirit of God almighty Somebody shout amen. Well, I've done it again. Amen. When the world sees me, I want them to identify me with Christ Jesus. I want to stand out like a sore thumb in this world. You can say what you want about the Amish people. I don't believe their doctrine's right. But I tell you one thing, when you see them people out somewhere, you automatically realize there's something different about them people. I want to be holy in my heart. I want my body to be holy. I want my spirit to be holy. I want my mind to be holy. I want my thoughts to be holy. I want my desires to be holy. How about you tonight? He said that we are to be holy because he is holy. If he's living on the inside of you, if he's really in there, there's going to be a separation from the old life, from the old ways. There's going to be a distinction between that Christian and the ways of this world. And if there's no distinction, that's what's, that's what's wrong today in the church. We've lost our identity. It's not the true church. You say, well, Brother Shelton, th th those people over there, they compromise. Then they're not part of the true church. Got too sharp, I'll be able to say it again. They compromised. You can no longer call them part of the true church. You listen, the, the true church is going to be a holiness church. Not a Baptist church, not a church of God, not a denomination. It's going to be a holiness church. A, a church that has separated itself uh, by the grace of God uh, to live pleasing unto the Lord, uh, to live according to the word of God, uh, not 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 swept away by the tide of this world. Uh, Hollywood's not going to be his teacher, uh, but his teacher will be the Word of God. Uh, this is still the road map. Uh, you know, I'll go back in time. I don't want to live in the past, uh, but you go back in the 50s and the 60s and 70s uh, when the church, when they really lived, that, that sanctified, separated, holy life, uh, they believed that. Uh, they had so much power with God, uh, but this modern-day church age, uh, hey amen, they lost that kind of power. Uh, They've lost that kind of anointing uh, because we've mixed ourselves uh, with the sin of this world. Uh, but the church, if you repent, uh, I believe God will forgive her. Uh, I believe God will cleanse her. Uh, I believe God will make her holy one more time. Make us holy, God. Make us into what pleases you, into what brings honor to your name. I've never, I've never rode by a tattoo parlor. Sister Albright, come on, please. I got to tell you, I got more, but I got to stop. I've never rode by a tattoo parlor and said, "I bet that's a great church out there." I'd like to go and preach revival there sometime. Would you? You ever rode by, there's a tattoo parlor on 64. Have you ever rode by there and thought, man, I bet that's a good church. I'd like to visit. I've never heard anything about it. You know from what's outside, they're advertising what they are on the inside. 
I've never rode by McDonald's and said, I imagine that's probably a good church. They advertise on their signs, on their display, in their building. They advertise what they do on the inside, what they are. Never rode by a hotel in town and, and thought, wonder, wonder what kind of pet store that is. Wonder what kind of animals they sell in there. No, they advertise so that what you see tells what they are inside when you go in. Same thing with the Christian. What are you advertising for? Who are you advertising for? Are you advertising for Hollywood, and glamour girl, and glamour boy? Or are you on display so that when people see you, they know that Christ is living inside your heart? The same man that said it was wrong for me to have a mustache, you see, I'm growing it back. The same man that said that sinned when he went and talked about me behind my back. The same man said it's wrong for him to have a mustache. That was wrong for him to go talk about me behind my back. If he had a problem, he should have come to me, come to me personally and said, Brother Shelton, I don't agree with your mustache. It was wrong. So that man trying to be holier, holy, because he didn't wear a mustache, bless God, and I could never fellowship with that man because he does, was in sin. Sinned against me with his tongue. Which is the greater sin? Be what you are. Be real. When you advertise in this world, in your job, in your family get-togethers out there at Walmart, be on display for Christ. So that when people see how you are, how your attitude is, how you dress, what your actions are. Some of the meanest people I've ever been around in my life is some of those folks that got that outward looking right, but that heart's full of hatred and venom. That don't identify anything to do with Christ. Make us holy inwardly. and Make us hold, holy outwardly. Make us a holy people that we are on display, earthen vessels, earthen treasures in this world that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That when you see my life, you don't have to wonder what's in my heart. You don't have to wonder who I'm for and whose side I'm on. Just as sure as that business advertises, so you know what you get when you go there. God, help us to be on display the same way as holy vessels that when people get around us, they know that we're different and they know what we are, that we identify with Christ. Can you shout amen tonight? Will you stand, please? i got to close. Christ is sanctifying us. Our attitudes get wrong sometimes. Has yours ever gotten wrong? Sometimes we act in a way that we shouldn't act. That ever happened to you? We ask the Lord to forgive us. He's sanctifying us. He's growing us. He's building us. He's working on us. He don't just break us in pieces and throw us away. If your desire and my desire is not for higher ground, higher living, holy living, then how is Christ in our heart? That's not my desire to grow in God and to move up in God and to be more like Christ. That's what God's doing in us. He's trying to conform us so that Christ is seen in us in every aspect of our life. We read about Christ in the Word of God and we realize sometimes how far away we really are from being Christ-like. We ask God to work on us, mold us and shape us, make us like your son. Make us holy, holy, sanctified people that house the power of God. 
can be used in the darkness of this day. I want everybody to come to will, please. I want us to come and just stand, please. If you're able to, you can make an order where you are, but I want us to come if you're able to stand.